Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk with uh, this uh, distinguished audience uh, about potential solutions uh, for energy um, uh, challenges that we have in the world today. What I'm going to tell you today is really about uh, changes that are going on now and really the future. Some of them are very near term, some of them are a little bit longer term, but they really revolve around the idea of chemists and physicists doing basic science and then building and standing on the shoulders of those giants that did basic science to understand how materials function so that we can build them into devices that become commercial items that make an impact on our global energy challenges for the future. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So in this first slide, um, in this first slide, this was a, a, an article that was written in the Wall Street Journal uh, some time ago, and uh, not my opinion, but basically saying that we, have a, we need to bring less power to the people. Uh, that's really uh, the solution for our energy. And, th and, this, and this particular journalist mentioned uh, 10 uh, ideas on how we might do that. And two of them I'm going to discuss with you today. Uh, one is about uh, implementation of, of uh, new solar energy methods with new materials, and then uh, uh, the impact of lighting and displays. We saw in the last talk, if you look at uh, the impact on, on energy, you can see that residential industry and, uh, uh, and, and, um, and commercial properties and buildings use enormous amounts of energy. Most of that's light and heating, and some of these problems can be addressed through uh, chemical sciences. So what I'm going to tell you about today is the impact of chemistry and nanoscience and materials uh, in the area of uh, th three particular areas that uh, I've been working in and others have been working in. One is in the area of organic light emitting diodes. And these uh, light emitting diodes uh, are essentially plastic materials that have been developed uh, fairly recently, actually. And now they're going, televisions and mobile displays are being made out of these particular materials. And the next television that uh, you will want to buy is going to be AM OLED, which is Active Matrix uh, Organic Light Emitting Diode Televisions. And I'll show you some amazing pictures, but they use very little energy, uh, a few volts to drive them. They're literally as thin as... Uh, 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 maybe 10, 10 pieces of paper, uh, and they're really dramatic. And so people have been talking about conductive polymers going to revolutionize the world, and everybody's saying, oh, that's nonsense. Well, it's, the future is here, and uh, this summer you will see those televisions uh, being released, and uh, they will make an impact on, the ener on energy. The other one that's really not very far behind is the idea of using plastic materials that can be used for lighting. Uh, these are highly efficient materials that you can make thin film uh, printed plastics. I'll show you some wonderful pictures. Uh, and I have a large number of slides, but most of them are pretty pictures that you can see uh, the demonstration and prototypes of these materials. These are very efficient uh, plastic thin film materials that are more efficient than incandescent light bulbs, as you can read in the slide. Also, solar cells can be made out of these materials, and, uh, and, and we hope that in the future you'll be able to use them. Uh, plastics could be coated on all the surfaces and, and, and gather the energy uh, from very low lighting conditions and uh, to harvest uh, the, the photons that are in this room uh, and in any room and on roofs and et cetera uh, in the future. But we have a ways to go in that one in particular. The impact of basic science, uh, as you all uh, may know, has had a tremendous impact. Uh, it's, impa it's built the internet. I mean, as you may remember, uh, people were just trying to figure out how to transfer big pieces of data when they were doing uh, defense-related research. And so they developed this, this uh, ARPA net, which led to the internet, which completely revolutionized the entire world. Uh, modern imaging uh, technologies came from uh, basic nuclear uh, research, uh, which people sometimes say, why are we doing high energy research? It makes no sense whatsoever. 
well, actually, MRI and all the sort of medical imaging techniques were born out of those basic scientific discoveries. And even more important, as one of the speakers said today, mo many times scientific discovery is completely by accident. And uh, to do world-class science and to find those innovations is to look for those surprises and then explain them. And when you do that, then you find revolutionary discoveries uh, come out of that. Well, um, I know my audience, uh, as they say. Uh, there was this guy, Niels Bohr, who was a pretty important guy uh, who developed atomic theory, a, a, a Danish uh, scientist, University of Copenhagen, 1913. And this was a basic scientific discovery that maybe people thought was pretty profound, but they said, you know, what does that have to do with application? Well, I can tell you that people took advantage of understanding that in Schrodinger, and others developed quantum theory, which developed orbitals. And the chemical orbitals and the definition of those chemical orbitals and the understanding of those orbitals led to the ability to take organic molecules with these orbitals and get them to overlap in pancake structures and uh, crystallize them. And this is a tetrathiopulvaline uh, tetracyanoquinodimethane. It's a, a chemical structure. Uh, that was discovered by uh, Dwayne Cowan and Johns Hopkins in 1972, uh, which really, really uh, understood that when you crystallize these flat molecules with uh, these orbitals, they can overlap to form conductors. And this was a profound discovery. Uh, this was my advisor, uh, and uh, uh, a Danish scientist, uh, Klaus Beckhard, uh, who was a postdoctoral uh, prior to me being in that group. So, this was a, a really amazing discovery and was one of the first organic materials that conduct electricity. And so the story I'm telling you is about basic science and how it, it leads to revolutionizing the world. Shortly after that, and uh, I, I, w I wish Klaus was here. This is the only time I've ever seen Klaus with a tie in my entire life. I have no idea why he is wearing a tie but someone captured the moment in a photograph. So this was a fantastic picture I was able to find off the internet. Uh, what Klaus did very shortly after that was discovered, he was a professor at the University of Copenhagen, and, uh, and still is, um, discovered what are called the Beschgard salts. And these are crystalline compounds that you can see the green things are these orbitals that overlap with each other. And it led to the first organic-based, carbon-based superconductor. And these were studied. Uh, and lots of basic science were done in these things. And, and actually, uh, something that, that came out of this was the discovery of C60 was shortly after this. And the discovery of C60 was fully understood because of many great scientists, but Klaus and, and Dwayne Cowan did a lot of basic science that helped us understand how C60 uh, actually conducts. Again, the understanding of these materials was, was really revolutionary and important. In 1976, uh, Alan McDermott uh, uh, discovered, uh, uh, and this was an accident. It was completely by accident. He was, uh, Professor Shirakawa was a professor, um, uh, a visiting professor at University of Pennsylvania. And later, uh, Alan McDermott in the early, in the sort of mid-70s, went to visit uh, uh, Professor Shirakawa. And there was a Korean graduate student in, in Professor Shirakawa's lab. And they were making polyacetylene because they were trying to make plastics that conduct electricity. Because they had these you know, alternating double bonds and they could get the orbitals all line up with each other. These clouds of orbitals can create a conductive pathway. And uh, he saw this Korean graduate student. He, was, he said, what, what is this you have in your flask? It's this golden film. And he said, ah, that's polyacetylene. And he said, that's not polyacetylene. And they went and looked, and the Korean grad student had made a miscalculation on the amount of catalyst to make the material, and had made this unknown form of polyacetylene that had never been discovered. And Alan McDermott is sort of a, 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 a Thomas Edison type of scientist, and, and you know, very quickly said, oh, this is a very interesting. Can I take this with me? And cut off the foil and snuck it on the airplane and came back. And, treated it with iodine and found the first uh, conducting polymeric material ever. And then later was awarded the Nobel Prize for this, looking for surprises and explaining them. So with that, uh, uh, the problem with this is that these plastics, they're not stable, they don't dissolve. So 
there's no applications, but still it was an important scientific discovery. Later, in 1985, a group, uh, several groups discovered a way by putting these R groups, alkyl groups, on these polythiophenes that you could make them uh, soluble. And so that was really important to make processable plastics. But again, they weren't very conductive. And then we came along and discovered these regioregular polythiophenes, which uh, really dramatically increased the electrical conductivity of the materials. And that led to uh, the development of transistors, primitive electronics, and solar cells. And so that was a, but we really stood on the back of giants uh, with, uh, with that discovery. The field has progressed enormously. In 1990, this is where we were. There was no such thing as a, as a, as a polymeric transistor. Polymeric light emitting diodes, it's plastic materials you apply electricity to that light up, had been discovered, but just discovered. There were no solar cells. There was really no commercial activity going on in this area at all. If you look at printed electronics today, we have OLED televisions and displays that are now coming to market. Samsung and LG have both announced that they're going to sell televisions this year to next year. Uh, uh, LG is investing 2.5 to $3 billion. OLED lighting, I'll show you prototypes that are on the way. Uh, transistors are already being used. Uh, Regioregular polythiophene is printed on plastic and used in, tra in train tickets uh, in uh, Germany already. And then solar cells have a little bit of ways to go. So I'm going to go pretty fast through the rest of this talk to show you some interesting examples. So these organic uh, uh, semiconductors are important because you can print them. And the printing allows you to, for simple and inexpensive manufacturing. And shown on this slide are plastic uh, solar cells that are printed on plastic. These are two millimeter thick 13 inch OLED televisions that have been made out of these materials and fu futuristic displays. And I'm gonna cover these three topics, light emitting diodes, solar cells, and transistors. The advantages of this, uh, of these materials is you can make, you take the plastic, you make an ink, you can print it. The, the printing that's shown here are the actual printing from polyisea, spin out of Siemens, where they print these transistors made out of regioregular polythiophene. You can print these on any surface, and you can have electronics almost anywhere. So the first thing I want to tell you about is printable transistors. And basically, the idea I've already told you is to take these alternating double bonds, you, you make a polymer and a plastic material that conducts. And on the bottom, you see a cloud of electrons, that, uh, uh, orbitals that all line up and allow you to propagate charge. But understanding the basic science behind these things really is the key. So we made a material, I say like a Lego block, that is the front of the molecule has a front and it has a back, and if you connect the front to the back, you make a nice material. You know, legal block, if you put the back to the back, it doesn't make a good structure. It's the same thing that we did. By doing that, you increase the electrical conductivity to up to 10,000 times. And that was a really important uh, uh, thing and that we did. And we made a synthesis, a way to doing this, but what was important to make it on a large scale and in a cheap way, and the synthesis on the bottom that we discovered, you can do this at room temperature, so you can make this on a very large scale. So if you look at, if you look at, these things can be manufactured on now uh, hundreds of kilograms uh, at a commercial cost. They're still very expensive. We're on that thousand dollar a gram, or you know, between a hundred and a thousand dollars a gram. But we're still, uh, these are specialty chemicals that take very little for electronics. We have the scale, but we have to understand the basic science. So nanoscience is very important here. Uh, if you're looking at, these are actually polythiophene nanowires that are 30 nanometers wide. These are, the width of that, those nanowires is the length of the polymer. We, we had no idea these even existed uh, when we first started out. But we were first, um, we first ran into these when I was spending three months with Thomas Birnholm, and uh, we discovered the first, or he discovered the first polythiophene nanowires. We had no idea what they were, and it took us a while to figure out what the structure were was, but once we were able to figure that, out that structure, then we had a very good idea that those nanofibrils were the length of the polymer uh, and, and stacked on top of themselves, making these nanofibrils. And by, by understanding that, we were able to understand the charge transport in these materials, and these nanofibrils, if you take an AFM image of them, as shown on the far left, you can see this cartoon that I have and it helps us to understand how these things conduct electricity. 
And by understanding how they conduct electricity, it allows you to understand how to design solar cells and transistors and devices. And so this basic science is really uh, critical. So these things I've already, I've already told you are being used. People are trying to get them cheap enough to make RFID tags. As they get cheaper and cheaper, we hope to see plastic uh, tags on everything. OLEDs. You can make polymers that uh, uh, you apply electricity to and they fluoresce. They can, you can make red, blue, and green. If you make red, blue, and green, you can make a television. And that's what uh, we have. This is an old slide that said performance is an issue. Performance has been solved uh, in the last couple of years. You can do roller roll screen printing, inkjet printing now. You can put these anywhere on anything. They have the possibility to do lighting and displays I've been talking about. And it's really interesting. If you look on the left is an LCD TV and it has all of these things in it. And these new OLED televisions are really interesting because you eliminate so many of these layers and you save enormous amount in the cost of producing these televisions. And so that's one of the reasons that people are very interesting. How does it work? You have a polymer, you apply electricity to it, you generate a plus and a negative charge, and that's plus and a negative charge is an excited state that's called an exciton, and one way for it to release the energy is to give off light. And, and depending on the polymer that you can change, you can make red, blue, or green. And you can put these things all together and, uh, and then make uh, your red, blue, and green, you can make televisions. And so you can make, if you make them yellow, you can make yellow signs. If you make red, blue, and green, you can make televisions as shown on the top. The mar this has progressed enormously. From 2002, you can only make sort of yellow displays. And then very rapid in 2004, prototype TVs were made. And then in 2007, Sony released the first display that was made out of all, uh, all small molecules. And this is a fully printed display here. And then the next slide shows a Samsung television uh, that, uh, or this may be Panasonic, that is uh, uh, not a prototype, but one that, can, that was sold. What about the future? I mean, these are the televisions. You're gonna buy one of those. They're gonna be OLED. They, they use low, low energy, few volts. They're great, they're not like plasma, they're not heavy. But what about the future? What else can we see? What about displays? I don't know if you can see this, but that's somebody's hand behind a screen that you can see through completely. So OLED displays that are completely see-through. You're talking about uh, telephones that, ha that are made of OLED that you can wrap around a flexible uh, strap that you could wear on your arm uh, as a bracelet. Uh, this is a, this is a, a pull-out Google, it's a see-through phone that uh, would look like this, and then you'd close it and all the OLED displays would come up uh, to be your phone that you could just put in your, uh, in a little small, uh, like a cigarette lighter or something in your phone. You can already buy this, uh, this is a watch. It's made by Sony, it's a smart watch that has music and all these things and it has an OLED display on it. So you can print these uh, on things that are flexible and small. Uh, I think it's gonna completely revolutionize electronics. It's, uh, it's coming, it's, it's coming. Uh, all the uh, major manufacturers are, are working in this area. Lighting. If you had red, blue, and green, combine them in the right way, you can make white. Or if you have blue and orange, you can also make light, white. This is a GE, has been working in this area to replace the incandescent light bulb. You can see see-through lighting. You can imagine your uh, windows in your house that would be windows during the day and at night they would be lights. Uh, the timeline is near. It's 12, 13, 14. It's coming. Uh, I'm going to show you. There's a lighting uh, conference that just occurred uh, a couple months ago, and these are photographs of all different kinds of lighting displays by uh, Osram, Konica, the, on Minolta, Fraternity, and then you can just see Philips lighting, uh, all made of plastic materials that can be printed. This is a, uh, an automobile lighting uh, display at the bottom by LG Chem, and you can make different colors. So that's lighting. Uh, there is a lot of money being put into this area, and it's, and it's coming. So with the last minute or so I have left, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, solar cells. Well, you can print these, and you combine them with C60. This is a plastic film, and if you shine light on it, you can make power. Uh, they're not terribly efficient. But one of the great things about them is they can be see-through and you can make windows, coatings for windows, hopefully someday that we can coat all the windows and, and, and absorb light and make 
uh, power from those things. And so that's the holy grail uh, for organic photovoltaics. Uh, we are right about the um, eight, uh, you can make about 6% module efficiencies in the lab, you can make 10%, but we have a ways to go. And the conversation has changed dramatically with the discovery of uh, Marcellus Shell. People are a lot less interested in this kind of solar in the United States now because of the Shell discovery. But we, nevertheless, off-grid applications are, are probably going to be there. Where are we now? We're, there's 10% in Champion Lab cells, about seven years worth of lifetime. If you think of these as throwaway solar, it's really, really very interesting. The cost is high, but there's no real big manufacturing going on yet. It's only a few people that are doing uh, manufacturing. I'm going to skip the science piece. It says how it works. Uh, Denmark is uh, leading the way in this. Uh, Professor uh, Frederick Krebs at Riso National Labs in DTU is really the leader in large-scale manufacturing of uh, these are polythiophene, regenerator polythiophene things. He's made these hats that uh, they were distributed at Roskilde Music Festival and uh, is using them uh, in Africa. Uh, so he's a real pioneer. There's a company called Miko Print, which is in Denmark, which is a really world-leading printing company for solar cells. The efficiencies aren't great, but it's a start, and we think that we can have ubiquitous sol solar everywhere. We're doing that at a company I called Plextronics that I started. You can imagine these things being in uh, displays to absorb light to make new displays. That's where they're likely to see their first uh, entry points, uh, uh, sensors, things like that. So with that, I hope that you will uh, uh, have some glimpse at not only the far, little bit further future, but the very near future. And all of these things are low energy. They're made out of materials. And we stand on the back of basic science to get to these, these, these applications. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. We already feel a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> you have a question? That's just a fascinating talk. Uh, really enjoyed that. Now, talking about sustainability, when it comes to electronics, we always hear about these rare metals uh, that need it here and there, and they are of strategic uh, importance uh, to make electronic devices. Are you telling us now that that's going to go away, and we're pretty much going to be making all of these things from organic materials? Uh, that, that's, that, that's the hope and dream. I mean, you can make thiophene from corn, so uh, maybe there's a tie-in we could talk about. But uh, yeah, no, we think that uh, these materials, if you look at the, um, this, this is the chart that shows the efficiency. This is an old chart. We're now at 10% uh, in the efficiency. But if you look uh, compared to silicon and uh, things like that, we're, we're still a ways off. But if we can get to 10% with 10 year lifetime, I think you'll see these things ubiquitously be everywhere. I don't want CAD, cadmium telluride on my roof. I'm a chalcogen, I have a PhD in chalcogen chemistry. I don't want CAD tell on my roof. And I don't want SIGs with cadmium, indium, gallium, selenide on my roof either. I mean, maybe you do. I don't. Silicon, uh, you know, amorphous silicon has some possibility, but, uh, but plastics is, uh, I have one word for you, plastics. Well, I, I, I'll just say this is exactly the sort of innovation we need, and I was pointing out in my yeah, talk. Yeah. So it's exactly. a great talk. Thank you. Anybody else? One more? Yes, please. Martin V. Guild of DTU. Plastics is the future, my friend. I recall somebody said many years ago in the movie. Uh, and it still is. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation with a background in plastics or polymers. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. I'd like to address to you the issue of, uh, you use the words discover and understand and basic science and the importance of basic science. Now, uh, this is called the ATV the Academy of the Technical Sciences. So what are the distinctions between basic science, technical science, natural science, and where is the role of the engineering in here? Can you, can you elaborate? I think maybe you are an engineer by heart, <laughs> maybe chemist by training. You've been moved 
the, in your research, away from basic science, understanding of how nature is constructed and maybe understanding how things to maybe more inventing with a focus things that can be manipulated and designed using the building blocks of nature. Could you please elaborate on the role of engineering and technical sciences relating to the word basic science? Yes, thank you. That's an excellent question. I think one of the things that, this is my opinion, and I don't mean to be terribly provocative, but, uh, but basic, I think there's a complete continuum between basic science, applied sciences, technical sciences. If you look at the basic sciences, there's no problem with doing basic science for curiosity-driven science. There's no problem with that at all, and I certainly support that in every sense of the, way, of the word. But what's really interesting to me is that we as scientists and engineers have a toolbox, and we know how to do certain things and attack certain problems. And what I've learned by, I have two companies that I started, and I learned from that more than anything that industry has the most interesting problems. And often academics don't understand that some of the most interesting problems that are out there are owned by corporations. And so working on the applied sciences side, we can bring our toolbox to still do basic science, but have in some sense a big, a big impact on, and also solving some of the world's most difficult problems. And so often we don't, know in, as basic scientists what the problems are. And when we go and talk with our colleagues in industry, uh, then we find out what those problems are. And sometimes those are absolutely fascinating in every way and really drive you to sort of do the whole continuum of interdisciplinary science and then bind with your colleagues to try to solve those problems. Thank you very much. <laughs>